Um, thank you very much. We have uh, three uh, fascinating um, in, uh, presentations there. Um, I'd just like to add one point myself, one observation in particular, in re reply to uh, um, some of the comments that, that uh, Sir Roderick mentioned. I'm struck when I listen to the comments of the, uh, the, the arguments of, of, of Lawrence Friedman um, uh, in his book, The Evolution of Nuclear Strategy, where he, where he describes Ronald Reagan as a, a revolutionary who, who never accepted nuclear deterrence. And he said that revolutionary uh, zeal took three incarnations, the first of which was where he allowed his administration to, uh, to, to uh, play with the idea of war fighting in the first few years of the administration, which of course contributed to, to the, the nuclear war scare. The second iteration of that was his attempt to escape the nuclear dilemma through the uh, um, announcement of, of, the, of the SDI of Star Wars in, in March 2000, uh, in, in 1983, uh, again trying to escape the nuclear dilemma through, through defences. And the third one that, that Friedman talks about is how ultimately Reagan tried to defuse the, the nuclear tensions through arms control agreements, of course, the first of which for him was the 1987 INF Treaty. But of course, the, 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 that arms control process was only made possible uh, through Geneva, through the whole promise process of summitry. Uh, and, and that, of course, is what we're celebrating today. So what I'd like to do is to open up the, the, uh, the floor uh, to questions on any aspect of our three presentations on, on the road to the summit between 83 and 85. Who would like to go first? Julian. Yeah. Julian Cooper from Berlin, please. Um, I'll, I'll pass the three fascinating accounts. I, an interesting question always interests me about is the role in both countries, both mention, of the intelligence agencies. Because at this time in the States, there was a war between the DIA and the CIA on the scale of the Soviet military effort and many aspects of the, of, of, of the situation and the assessment. So it was never really clear to me what influence they really had upon US leaders or the, the elite, the decision-making elite. And the same in, in the Soviet Union. You have the KGB, the GRU, the other intelligence agencies. And uh, uh, how influential were they in shaping uh, the, the view of the leaders about the United States and the West? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a puzzle even today. Mm. To me. Sure, can I, shall I start? Please, yeah. Um, well, Michael Alexander, who is uh, Mrs. Thatcher's private secretary, diplomatic private secretary, used to say that she, she he used to say that Mrs. Thatcher never took any notice of intelligence assessments. That may or may not have been true. Charles Pearl says the same, but it may or may not be true. I think um, my impression, there are others here who know better than I do, is that <coughs> is that in, I don't know about the Soviet Union, but in Britain, of course, the discussions were part of the broader official discussion of what was going on. And the intelligence assessments, which is, of course, different from raw intelligence, uh, did feed into the policy debate um, and af affected it. Other things, particularly in America and in the Soviet Union, also affected the policy debate, the interests of the military, the interests of the military-industrial complex. And I, I think that to tease this out and pin it down to one particular thing is actually not possible. I'd like, if I may, to, however, go back to, because it's not entirely relevant to your point, this business of the um, Minuteman vulnerability. I'm sure you're absolutely right that a lot of people in Washington believed in the proposition, but just so that people know what the proposition was, the proposition was that the Soviets now had heavy missiles which were so accurate that they could take out all the American land-based missiles, the Minutemen. Um, now, I asked at the time, uh, why would they want to do that? And the answer was, the general secretary would take out all the missiles, not this general secretary, the next general secretary, take out all the missiles, then say to the president, I know you've still got the submarines and you've still got the bombers, but do you really want to go to the next stage? Why don't you make these concessions? I mean, that is higher fantasy. People did believe it, but it was also the argument was a product of internal fighting inside the American administration. Between 
The CIA on the whole, if you look at their records so far as I've done so, were on the whole fairly good at their assessments. But other things, getting to Richard Pipes, as you know, challenged the CIA. The military had their own interests. And I think it's a it's sort of witch's brew that you can't in the end say what was the most important, whether it was the frog's teeth or the half-born baby or what it was that actually made the brew as potent as it was. Um, I'll say just briefly that um, the CIA's equivalent to our office at the State Department um, has put out a very good kind of collection of uh, about 100 or so national intelligence estimates that you can find. You just, just Google Reagan intelligence in the, the Cold War that I think is very helpful and at least illuminating a lot of what Reagan was, was seeing and sometimes would write on. The gist of it is that the, Reagan was getting intelligence assessments that the Soviets were in facing severe <coughs> economic difficulties, but their military was ramping up um, nonetheless, and that we face a new generation of land-based missiles of improvements to the SS-18s. Now, what does that mean in terms of the perceptions of US policymakers? Well, the perception that the Soviets had a first strike capability to them meant that this that would embolden them to support um, you know, the regime in, in, in Nicaragua, to take risks in other parts of, of the world, to try to um, kind of to de-link America from its Western European allies. It, was, it, it wasn't so much as you know, the possibility that there's going to be a nuclear war, it's that what would that potential advantage, um, how might that shape Soviet decision making? Um, and the other thing I'll just say quickly is that it's, it's interesting to look at um, a book by, uh, about Andrew Marshall, the head of the Office of Net Assessment, who uh, had a very different view of, of uh, of the Soviet economy um, than the CIA analysts. I mean, I think he said, um, he said, I give the CIA a giant F when it came to uh, the understanding the Soviet Union. This is deja vu for me. I wrote my PhD on the minimum vulnerability question in American nuclear strategy. So I can't resist the temptation to actually add my pennies worth on this. Um, I think perhaps the, the best explanation apart from all the technical explanations that one could offer, and I could, believe me, um, on, on, on the minimum vulnerability question is the uh, a line, that, an argument that, that advanced by Richard Betts. Dick Betts describes that the, that the, that the concern about the, the, the hard target kill capability of the SS-18 and the SS-19 <coughs> long-range missiles in the context of the psychological relationship with parity that, that America experienced as the Cold War went on. What I mean by that is, Betz says, there were really three different levels of parity. And as you, we move from one to the third, to the first to the second to the third, that created anxiety in American mind. In the sense, the first level of parity was that, that there was a parity that both sides could blow each other up and, and destroy each other's cities. And that was really achieved early on uh, in, in, in the Cold War, really with the, the, the advent of ICBMs. The second level of parity was really uh, en encapsulated and encoded, codified, through the, the, the early SALT process, wh where you had a rough equivalence of, 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 of nuclear uh, launchers, missile launchers. And, and, but, uh, so that was codified then. But as the, the, the Russians then fractionated, i.e. started to put multiple warheads on their large boosters, what that did was, was it gave the perception that, if, OK, well, if, if SALT codified a second level of parity, then that must be parity plus. So what advantage does that give them? And, and, and are we therefore, in some senses, uh, psychologically uh, or militarily outmatched by that, that, that third level of, 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 of parity? So in a sense, there was, there was a psychological aspect of that. And that was linked to, to perception of the Soviet adventurism and linked also to Carter's weakness. So Carter planned to build the biggest human construction project in the history of man, with the, the, the multiple protective shelter schemes in Nevada and in, in, in Utah, bigger than the pyramids, bigger than the Great Wall of China. Reagan came to office, spent money on defense, didn't address the MX basing question at all, but by virtue of changing the tone, made the issue go away of minimum vulnerability, demonstrating that it was really a politically, a psychologically, socially constructed uh, perception of fear, which is why my book on the, on the subject is called The Politics of Threat, but I'll keep quiet now. To my mind, our leaders were sufficiently shaped 
already. <laughs> you, you may imagine, so for, for decades, for decades, the convention was that we have the most progressive social society on the earth, and uh, Marx's theory of uh, changing, the replacing one society of other <coughs> is a real one. So the capitalism is doomed to be substituted by, by, by socialism for decades, you know. And uh, in practical way, <coughs> in 1948, on certain Stalin, probably you heard this name, yeah? He said on Politburo, America is our enemy number one. It was extremely difficult to correct this uh, instruction for, for many years on the background of the ideolo ideology. That's why again and again what the courageous thing made Gorbachev when he replaced the class ideology, the ideology of class, uh, class struggle with the universally human, human values. And it's another reason why he is so, he is so not loved <laughs> thing in this way in his own, in his own country. Because he, he changed the uh, decades of uh, believing. Uh, I remember once uh, we brought to Andropov the project of his, uh, of his uh, presentation, <laughs> of his speech. He took the speech and said, it's an agrarian question that is settling. We were puzzled because there was no agriculture in our, in our project. And then he explained, who will bury who? Pakaronit, right? Yeah, right. Will bury who? He believed in it. And sometimes when the reality made in a way that they had to reconsider their, their uh, <coughs> views, they convinced, were convincing themselves of no, everything is okay. There were different deviations because <coughs> in Lenin and uh, in Lenin's mind, we had to uh, substitute capitalism with uh, more effective productivity. But it, <coughs> we failed in this. What to do? Then the arms race has been declared a form of class struggle. So how you could object the Minister of uh, Defense when he asked for new and new and new <laughs> money and makes new and new and new projects and so on? Because now you uh, just the betrayer of the uh, of the class uh, struggle, which is. The, the main thing that is happening in this day. In uh, September 84, Reagan, for the first time after four years, invited Gromyko to Washington. For, for four hours, these uh, meetings were not. Uh, and they talked about some as they say, in conceptual things. And Reagan was asking, what shall we do if you declare that you will destroy us? You have to, to defend and so on. It was a very simplistic thing. <laughs> Nevertheless, Gromyko was explaining to him the Marx theory of social <laughs> society changing each other. <coughs> you know? So uh, the background was already very, very difficult. But uh, Ministry of Cho our military complex and KGB, they added to it. First, because we were always in 
behind the United States. And many United States uh, uh, considerations about the Soviet military were false, just to permit have more money from, from the Congress. But in some real things, we were behind. We have to catch them up. And how you could neglect the necessity to catch them up if the main conception was only equality of forces prevents the war. Absolutely absurd. Then you have to, <laughs> if you don't want war, you have to raise always these stocks of, of armaments. And uh, then the first was uh, of this time, this kind of considerations, and the second, what the military industrial complex was, was a state and state, as you know, in, in the Soviet Union. And uh, the best uh, workers, the best engineers were there. You certainly know that there are entire cities built around the enterprises, the factories. So if you have to reduce your armaments, you have to stop the factories. It was really impasse, it's really, really uh, dead end. And many people in leadership itself understood it, but they don't have courage. Indeed. Thank you. Professor Schultz, uh, can I? Sorry. We're recording this, so if you if you can bear with us and, and wait for the microphone, that would be very helpful. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, yeah, I'm just just making a general announcement. Uh, Paul Schultz, now attached to Birmingham, uh, and in this period in the Ministry of Defence, trying to uh, see some of the intelligence material and try to make sense of what was happening. Um, in terms of what I've heard, and I, I'm sorry I missed the introductory uh, um, talk, isn't the an underlying pattern, which at the time is anxiety provoking on both sides, but which turns out to be benign as a result. On the American side, you have the window of opportunity, uh, pattern panic about SSBM counterforce duels, um, a sense of American weakness, American power having sagged under the Carter administration, uh, and dangerously therefore provoking uh, Russia. And in the Soviet Union, you have a, a, a sense of certainly concern about who these Reaganites were, what risks they were going to run. But behind that, an underlying anxiety about the strategic competition, the correlation of forces, There's the, which I was trying to understand at the time, uh, because the Brits really wanted to get a better view of, of, of the, the Russians at this stage. And the correlation of forces is the global scorecard, What's the relative strength of Russia compared to America? And there is a computer model we now learn, the Varian model, which says that, uh, well, I mean, allegedly declassified uh, the documents say if, it's, if Russia's relative strength goes below 70 in this clunky quasi scientific model, uh, then there is a risk of an American first strike. And in this period, it's dropping, Russian estimates themselves suggest, down to around 45. So both sides ha have, and this is the background to Abel Archer, uh, the, the, the belief that there's now a, a credible opportunity for the, Ru the Americans to take advantage of this disparity in correlation forces. So on both sides, there's a feeling this, this is a profoundly unsatisfactory position. But on the Russian side in particular, that it's unsustainable because the correlation of forces is going to drift down further unless something can be done. Uh, isn't, aren't, aren't those rather large but behind the scenes psychological and economic and military developments that the, the real prelude to the Geneva side. Okay. Uh, I think the, the, the rather uh, we use that one if we can. So, um, but if you can be the, the uh, person to count around, that'd be helpful. Rodri, do you want to pick up that, or you, uh, um, or, or, well, or, 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 or James? You, I'll, I'll say something you, quickly. Okay. Um, I mean, I think that this model, computer model, um, from what I've read, and I think you've read, it was more 
far more confident, Soviet computer was more confident than US intelligence and policymakers. Um, the kind of futuristics of the US capabilities that we all think about, or those who think about these things, with us, whether it's stealth or uh, Trident II, um, I think w w the ability was not at all clear until, ironically, you know, the moment when the Cold War was basically over. Um, and the same thing with MX basing, that by the time they finally start deploying it, I mean, that's what, 87, I think? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, the, the tide is, has shifted. Uh, in terms of the sense of vulnerability, it goes back before Carter, I mean, all the way back really to, to 72. Uh, and you, you, you see, even with the Ford administration, um, a real battle within the administration and outside that, 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 that's immediate regret that SALT has been a mistake. It is not doing what uh, we, Kissinger and others said it would in terms of moderating Soviet behavior. And meanwhile, because of the Vietnam syndrome, we are basically allowing the Soviets to, to, to pull ahead. And then the final point I'll just say is the one of the great ironies, I think, and to me it comes through in um, Professor Service's book, which I'll hawk uh, uh, here, uh, and that is of the, the enduring nature of the Soviet military industrial complex that ironically is more uh, is more of a thing in the Cold War than the American military industrial complex, whereas that coupled with the irony that America's ideological mission proves to be more potent and enduring uh, during the Cold War uh, than that of, of Marxist-Leninism. Um, and I think that that's something that, that comes through even through Reagan and the Bush period. Um, and, and certainly we have not uh, as yet uh, abandoned that. Uh, just to, to add a bit to that, firstly, the computer program and RIAN were different projects, as I understand it. Um, and the computer one was very clunky, and it was producing that impression. But the impression of declining capacity was not generated by the computer program. It was becoming widespread. Uh, it reflected what people were afraid of, uh, brightly, as it turns out. Um, both sides spent all their time calculating the correlation of forces, both sides from 1945, well, 1948 onwards, 1949, the first Soviet successful test, felt vulnerable. It's a perception of vulnerability, it seems to me, amongst other things, which drives this. And why you get things like the Minuteman controversy was a reflection of a sense of vulnerability rather than a reflection of anything in the real world. Um, I think the only other thing I have to say is the motto on both sides was if you want peace, prepare for war. If you look back on history, that is a maxim that has almost never worked. Okay. Thank you. Because preparation for war is often followed by war. To me, it's a stupid project. And uh, I, I believe we, we should look attentively to it. What is uh, saying now it's not convincing me very much. Because, why? In practical, there is no general correlation the forces that we were afraid of. We were afraid of, of so-called uh, means of first strike. The means of first strike were dec uh, decoupling the Soviet leadership, the Soviet uh, directional centers and so on. This is the, what the real, the real fear. And that's why when the Americans <laughs> began to make shuttle, some of our scientists came to, it was Brezhnev or Andropov, don't remember, and say, you know, this shuttle goes around the Earth, but it can do a small down over Moscow <coughs> and destruct it. It was so convincing that we immediately began to make our, our shuttle as well. Together with a space, uh, space station. So it was just impossible for our economy to make these two big projects. Even Americans didn't do a space station. And they convincing for 
for their, I believe, egoistic consideration as well. They wanted to work on it, they wanted to make money on it, and so on. While, while the American submarines were in such position in Norwegian fjords that they could destroy Moscow much, much faster than this uh, <laughs> future, future um, uh, shuttle. And I believe that this project to determine what in what situation we are now with the United <coughs> States, it served a second aim to have always, always uh, reasons, grounds to make more, ma more, more uh, armament. I believe that the order of figures wasn't 70 is bad. No, 70 was was tolerable, so to say. But since <coughs> And the project showed very, very quickly that we are below. There was another stimulus to, uh, to, to put more money. And this stimulus was very <coughs> negative for the, Soviet, uh, for the Soviet economy. Brezhnev, when he came to power, he knew very well uh, the military-industrial complex. He was full of strength, he was full of authority, because all party secretary uh, were his and the military complex he knew very well <coughs> and he really could uh, limit this uh, request, this uh, ask for money and so on. That's why we have such good, such good agreements with America uh, on start and other. But when uh, he had a stroke and another people uh, come to uh, determine foreign policy, there was a terrible spreading of resources because there were two uh, construction bureaus, as we say, and every construction bureau proposed its uh, missile or something like that. And first, Brezhnev <laughs> put <laughs> could uh, say what is, what is better. But at the, uh, at the end, really, we were spreading the money because every uh, construction bureau, the uh, military complex became a master in, in, the, in the Russian house, in the Soviet house. Thank you. Ambassador Logan. Um, Roderick said something about uh, the New York demonstrations, and um, this is a comment about <coughs> the, the role of public political opinion and, and debate, public debate in, in, this, in this story. Um, I'm not quite sure when the Second Cold War was supposed to have started, but in the 1970s, uh, that was the rebirth of CND in this country. And it's worth remembering that that is a time when domestic policy and foreign policy were separate. I mean, we live now in a globalized age where they're hopelessly entangled. Uh, in those days, it was extremely rare for a foreign policy issue to become a matter of political concern and therefore relevant to election outcomes and so on in the United Kingdom. And it's also an era, it, you know, it seems a long time ago in this day of, these days of pluralistic policy making, when policy was essentially a business made by civil servants making recommendations to ministers. Uh, the impact of um, CND and the opposition to the double decision in the 70s uh, was so strong that uh, this foreign policy, this defense policy issue became a domestic political interest, or uh, issue of, of, of domestic political importance. Uh, uh, and so, uh, the department I was dealing with, it working in, found this happening for the first time. Uh, and our reaction to this was really quite modern. We established a group of people consisting of uh, leading CND campaigners, trade unionists, journalists, you name it, to tell us about what was happening. And we told them also uh, what was happening from our point of view. And we established in our department an entire section 
whose job was to communicate with the public. I mean, those days it was mainly writing letters. It seems really quaint. Um, <coughs> but whatever, you know, uh, Mrs. Thatcher's attitude to, you know, opposition to uh, the double decision and so on might have been, uh, I'm really just trying to make clear that at the level below that, it was something which was taken really seriously. Respond to that? <coughs> Beyond saying that I'm trying to work out what impact things like CND had on government policy, and therefore we'll be coming back to you. I don't have any comment. I'll say briefly that uh, since um, there was some talk, oh, Ambassador Brightway was mentioning um, the film the day after, um, that there was uh, uh, a segment after it was shown with George Schultz kind of defending um, the Reagan administration's policies. Now, if you've just seen uh, cities in Kansas, you know, evaporated uh, for two hours, uh, you're maybe less interested in hearing a, an hour-long conversation with somebody like George Schultz. And I think that was that was that was pretty clear. Um, yeah, the I, people will get to it a little later today. But one thing about the politics, um, domestic and foreign politics, is to think about. Uh, the encounter at Reagan, this first moment where uh, Reagan bounds down the steps without a, his overcoat and meets uh, Gorbachev coming out of the car, uh, who's all bundled up. Um, I mean, that was something that he, only a seasoned, somebody who was such a seasoned politician as Reagan uh, would know to do that instinctively because having gone through all these political campaigns. Um, the, the funny thing to me is that then they encounter each other, they've outrun their interpreters and uh, Gorbachev what I read says, be careful, you'll catch a cold, and Reagan obviously has no idea what he's saying, so he just smiles and, and you know, shakes his head. No okay. can, I, can I just pick up? Please, yeah. I just want to make some recommendations about films, because David's pointed out 1985, the BBC film Threats, which is a terrifying film, but it was preceded by War Games in 19... 65, which was made for the 20th anniversary of Hiroshima, which the BBC thought was too inflammatory to show. It wasn't showed for another 20 years. Um, what I found interesting, I've been trying to find Russian films on the same subject, and there are very few. But there's one very interesting one, which was made in 1972, which is called Vyborcelli. And it is a remarkably calm and balanced account of the moral scruples that the nuclear scientists felt in Germany, Heisenberg, in America, Oppenheimer. It shows the uh, farm hall uh, eavesdropping of the German scientists and what they were talking about. And Kurchatov is the central figure. And it's basically about what Kurchatov thought was his moral duty in that context. It's a very, I think, unusual Soviet film. It was made in 72. I recommend all four of them. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I cannot understand whether the fear of our uh, people that the Americans could uh, suddenly make a strike on us was legitimate or no. It's a mystery for me. Because the fear, the scare was real, absolutely. And by the way, they <laughs> had prepared for the for the threat. I mean, in personal personal sense. But Schultz says that he and Reagan considered this uh, this fear absolutely unfounded. And more, Schultz said that he convinced Reagan to go <laughs> meet to go to meet the Russian leadership just in order to explain to them that the America will never will never open the nuclear war. But at the same time, there were con concepts both in America in the United States uh, and in Soviet Union which admitted possibility of nuclear war. Yeah. If they were studied and our general said Yes, if they make nuclear war, we will win. We will win. So, really, 
there was possibility that just for accident, for something unwanted, but un, so to say, evitable, we may, we may be found in a, a big trouble. That's to say that, again, Gorbachev was great to at least, if not eliminate completely, but at least to make it more, less, less possible, this, this threat. There were, there were 17, I believe, cases when they were counting possibility of, uh, of accidental nuclear, nu nuclear strike. And uh, I don't know whether it's correct, but I read uh, in American uh, books that there was a not known Soviet colonel that refused to execute the order to, to press the button. They, at least, uh, write about it with uh, confidence. That it was the unknown hero who saved the world. And ours, I was asking many, uh, our military men and uh, those who were in the military industrial complex, they refused this situation. But uh, nuclear agamnedon was, to my mind, possible. Okay. Uh, what's, what's one other dimension, we talked about public opinion, we've talked about uh, the, the, the debates within government. It's also worth mentioning the role of academia. Uh, in, in the early 1980s, there were a number of articles, uh, in, in particular the one called Victory is Possible, another one by Keith Payne, How to Prevail on Nuclear War. The, 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 there was an intellectual climate which actually was, was engaging with government, with policymakers, pushing one direction as well as the, the and, and, and of course provoking that general sense of, of disquiet at a popular level as well. Um, Anatoly said that Soviet generals spoke about winning a nuclear war. It's a very unusual general that gets up and says we're about to lose the next war. And of course our generals said the same thing. Uh, what they believed in is more complicated, I think, because they are for not being human. Um, on pressing the button, of course, there is a, uh, there was an incident when during an exercise, a Soviet exercise, Brezhnev was asked to press the button and got extremely nervous about it and said, are you sure this is only an exercise? When I press the button, nothing will happen. And that is testified, I think, in that uh, uh, thing that the Americans produced after they'd interviewed a lot of Russian generals after the end of the Cold War. Well, on that... You uh, wrote in your book, <laughs> okay. No, not yet. I no, 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 yes, yes. Uh, the book that translated in Russian already, there were quoting the American uh, military leaders, which uh, uh, admitted possibility of... Uh, <laughs> Anyways, on that note, we are actually over time, so what I'd like to do is to bring this session to a halt by thanking our, our speakers for fascinating uh, opening remarks for, for, the, for this day, and uh, it, it's, it's a, uh, the, the road to the summit, but also the road to the rest of the, rest of the day of more fascinating talks to come. So thank you very much.